All right, Dirk Hayher spent parts of two seasons starting for the Padres, not so hot, relieving for the Jays, excellent, before arm problems ended his career two years ago. He's now part of the Rogers Sportsnet team oh boy, this covering is the Jays. Badly. Yeah. Oh, that ball, of course, is still traveling five years wow. later. He's the author of three of the best recent books by athletes. The best sellers, The Bullpen Gospels, Out of My League, and Wild Pitches. And Manny Ramirez sent him a bunt cake oh. when he retired. He's like, not a yeah. fan. No. Look he did get people out in the big leagues, folks. Our yes. research department is trying to find the footage, but he did get <laughs> people out. There's a strikeout. Out. It was the National League. I had to have struck out a pitcher. You couldn't find a pitcher? This is what, every home run you ever gave up? Yeah, I well, like Hope okay. not, or we're going to be here all night. Hey, welcome <laughs> to the show, Dirk. Yeah, great to be here. Somebody get my agent on the phone, please. There's well, it's another a, one. It's a little late for that. Was, that. was that a fan who came onto the field to hit that home run? I think was it was that a father-son game. Father-son game. Very nice. All right. Well, good. Welcome. Adam. It's great to be here. Yeah. Please stay. <laughs> Despite that introduction, please stay for the next uh, for the next hour. And speaking of comebacks in a bigger sense, Dirk uh, Liriano, one of the great comeback stories of this year, uh, one of the star pitchers in 2006, got hurt, came back, really was on the junk pile over the winter, and, and nobody saw this kind of season coming. Well, the Pirates, I think they saw something right. coming, and, and they got him to adopt their philosophy, which is they wanted to become very ground ball centric as a team. Francisco Liriano, he took that to heart, and now you see him changing from that four-seamer to a good two-seamer and slider, and it makes that changeup that much more effective. And now he's going to go up against a lineup where most of the productive hitters are left-handed, and he's been so good all year against lefties. 131 batting average against left-handers. Sin Su Chu, we talked about earlier, is going to see so many plate appearances tonight. 0 .083, that is the batting average. He is completely overmatched. He has made an excellent turnaround. Good two-seamer, good changeup, good slider, throws a lot of strikes, gets a lot of ground balls. This could be a Cinderella performance for him just waiting to happen. You've got a guy in mind also hitting down in the order and another shortstop. Who do you have? Oh, I got Jose Iglesias, shortstop for the Tigers. And I'm going to take a page out of your book on this. I like him not because he's got great tools, because Lord knows he's got great tools, but he's a snake in the grass. He's going to be down in the order because you've got guys like Prince Fielder, Miguel Cabrera up in the center of the order to push him back, and that's where he's going to get his cookie. And he's going to do something with it. He's going to drive it in theater of October play. When those little things end up being so big, he has a chance to be a true Cinderella. And you know, as a storyteller, I like me some stories. So I think what he's really going to shine for came over from the Boston Red Sox to become a Detroit Tiger when Peralta got tangled up in that biogenesis nest. And now he has a chance to be the guy who knocks Boston out. That writes itself right there. That's a bestseller. Wow, can you imagine if he lengthens that lineup as good as it is? They get production out of the nine hole. Wow. I don't think the Boston Red Sox want to imagine. Four. And the third most famous oh. homer of the day. <laughs> what, what? It's not the anniversary, but Garrett Atkins, oh. it's deep and I don't think it's playable. Manny Ramirez, it's deep and I don't think it's playable. Who's that pitcher, Dirk Hayhurst? I, uh, I don't know. Where, but what about the, it's good you're turning to the camera so we can see it's you. There's a lot of head <laughs> motion there. A lot of whip back. Do you have any kind of uh, Still hurts. I'm still in therapy. Yes, I still for... still see a massage therapist. Explains a lot. Explains a lot. But it's catching on because some of these things we're asking people to recreate. Here are various fans doing the Dirk. Oh, that's cold. <laughs> as part of postseason pride. You see what's missing here is that part where they swear into their mitts. There's, uh, there's none of that. I, it's a vital point. Well, and that guy hit his wall against the head. He don't do it in a bag. Wow. Do not do it in a men's room. Wow. Right. One, we've got one guy concussed, and the other guys, I don't even need to talk about oh, it. Baseball, you are a cruel mistress. And you know, Pedro talked about your feel, and it really gets challenged when the pressure is out there, the intensity goes up. You heard Marlon Bird talk about it after the segment. He said that, you know, well, I'm trying to slow things down. I'm trying to absorb this, get in the moment, play it like normal. Well, it's very difficult because this is not a normal situation. So out goes Cueto, and here in the first inning, we have something that looks like it's insignificant, but it actually turns out to be a domino that starts the dominoes falling and ends up pulling Johnny Cueto out of action here. We got the bunt. And look, if you're a pitcher and you're in a big game, what you want most of all is to stay on that mound and find what is familiar to you the rhythmic winding and delivering of your pitches. That is your comfort zone, that is what you know. When the 10th man is on you and the pressure is up, you want to go to what you know, 
And when you start having bunts or misplays out there, it takes you off the mound, it takes you out of your element, and suddenly that stuff starts to creep in and you lose control of yourself. Now, let's flip this around. Let's look at Liriano on this one. Okay, we've got Russell Martin. Not only did he do it from behind the dish, he did it while he was at the dish swinging the bat, but specifically the defense here. What this says to Liriano is, go ahead, throw whatever you want, whenever you feel like it. You have a brick wall back here. I am going to stop it. I don't even know how he got that. That was a 40-foot pitch. And then here's the out pitch in the dirt that makes Liriano so, so effective. That good slider tight down in the zone, off the dish, into the dirt. It's a swing and miss pitch, but only if you trust your catcher to block it. Liriano can trust Russell Martin to be there for him. Great night for him all the way around. Yes, we have to do something to correct something we did in last night's broadcast. <laughs> we beat the heck out of uh, one of our commentators, Dirk Hayhurst, <laughs> by showing you every home run he ever gave up in the major leagues. Well, after diligent research and some bribery, I believe, we have managed to find the well, following now, montage the first, of Dirk Hayhurst's and they strikeouts. Tulowitzki, to swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. Ryan Zimmerman. Bye, Felicia. Wait, there's more than two? Yeah, wait, we got five. Carl Crawford, <laughs> no chance against him. Evan Longoria, and I have to talk carefully over this because Evan Longoria now swears a bad word. And finally, Ryan Howard. Very nice. Thank you. That was Thank lovely. You. Not a bad group of guys to strike out <laughs> really? either. Yeah. Uh, it was only five, but it was five good guys. Yeah, just... Felicidades, my amigo. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll start with Dirk Hayhurst. You were Cobb's teammate for a year. What do you mean he's got a Vulcan grip on the ball, Spock? <laughs> well, Captain, it's only logical <laughs> that when you want to throw a good changeup, you got to get those two powerful fingers. These are your fastball fingers. You need to get those off the ball and go to those weaker fingers. And you do this so that you can deaden the pitch without actually changing your mechanics because that's a giveaway. Mm -hmm. So the FOSH, or the Vulcan death change, as I like to call it, is actually the live long and prosper over a two-seam grip, and then you hold it like that. And the two power fingers are off the, the side of the ball, and now this open spot here on top, it allows you to throw with the same fastball arm speed, but you get that deadened effect, and Cobb throws that very well, among a multitude of other things he does very well. He's a very composed pitcher in total. He has a good fastball that he can run and sink and cut. Not a lot, but he keeps it at the bottom of the zone, and that's really the difference maker. When you're a right-hander, you have to work down. And then he supplements in the Vulcan death change, yes. and that, I think, is, is what makes him so successful. A good fastball that he changes speeds with, using the changeup in the right situations, and that makes all the other pitches he have gravy. All right, we'll stop the Star Trek references right now. Here's Mr. Martinez and Mr. Hayhurst. Dirk? Thank you, Keith. Now, Lest I embarrass myself any further with uh, my pitching exploits and wind up with more pointy ears, I'm just going to sit this out and ask the true expert on this with the 18-year career. You've got some great pitches in your arsenal, and I want to talk about the grips and what you used. But before we go into too much detail, you have an unfair advantage. Your, your hands, it's like shaking a bunch of bananas. You could wrap your fingers around the ball and tie a bow on the other side. <laughs> we have to show the camera. This is, this is my grip. This is me all the way around the ball holding it. Pedro, show how far. Show, oh, my goodness. Look at that. That is unfair. <laughs> Just absorb the whole baseball. When you can wrap your hands around a ball like that, it gives you a, a lot more tools at your disposal. You can guide it, you can sink it, you can cut it. But let's talk about your fastball. You had a tremendous fastball, had a lot of action. Can you show me the grip you used? Well, before anything, thank you, Carl Rickham, for, for such a compliment <laughs> after facing so many guys. But uh, the fastball will be a cross-seam fastball okay. primarily. Uh, you know, I, I, I managed to get it off my hand as far as I could and uh, deliver it that way. Did you use your thumb? Fastball. Did you use your thumb to Yes, I did, but lightly. I, uh, sometimes I would, I would drop the ball by accident because I never had it tight. It was always loose. Nice, let's see some of that nasty Pedro Martinez heater in action. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now that ball's not actually rising, but it looks like it is because you've got that arm angle. Well, I, I, I was a three quarter uh, angle and, and I, I managed to kind of open my wrist and let that ball just fly fly off the fingers like that. Right. Now, the curveball is very different from the fastball, obviously, both in the mechanics of how you throw it and how you grip it. You also had a great curveball. I'm going to use the adjective great a lot when I describe your, your arsenal of pitches. Thank you very much. Show me this breaking ball and let me bask in the glory of the grip. Well, the curveball was a little bit different because I never handle 
using this this finger on, on on top of the ball like normally a pitcher would do. No, yeah, I do that. No pointer so finger. I I went to spiking it this way, and actually making sure that this finger will work as a as a center so that the ball wouldn't rotate to any other side. I wanted it to be as as straight as as, as it could, but going down that way. So I made sure that I threw the, this half of the ball down in the area where I wanted to. All right, let's check this thing. Let's check it out. Curveball. There you go. And the bottom drops out. That's not Uncle Charlie. That's Lord <laughs> Charles right there. That is some steep <laughs> tilt. Oh, gosh, it's. I've never had a curveball that good, nor have I had a changeup as good. And I'd never threw the Vulcan death change. There's another Star Trek reference. But you threw a circle change, am I correct? Yes, circle change. Can you show me that? The circle change actually came off the fastball. Okay. Because I had 80% of my fastball being crossing fastballs. Uh, I, I would switch from there to here. And then my fingers would do the rest. As you were saying, the two powerful fingers will go to this side and the, the heavy part of the ball, off-center ball, will go to the, to the weaker fingers. Right, and, and that lets you that way. kill the velocity without changing your mechanics and letting the, pitch, or the hitter know that you've changed the pitch on it. Right? And, also, and also a lot more movement. Oh, yeah. A lot more movement. Speaking of movement, let's check this out. <laughs> ah, that is delicious. Oh, man. I'm so jealous right now. I'm so, and you had another pitch. It's like this wasn't enough for you. You have three superstar pitches. You added another one late in your career. You picked up the cutter, right? And this was kind of a throwaway pitch for you. You didn't really use it often, but when you wanted to, it was still nasty. Show me the cutter. Uh, well, I, I, it was never my intention, but as you know, uh, you have to bring something new to the league every year. And I had that weapon saved in, under my sleeves. Uh, for any moment where I, I was desperate for a pitch that nobody had seen often, so I, I ran to a cutter, and what I did was um, one of my ex-teammates, Ugi Urbina, told, taught me that to off-center it a little bit, and then I saw Mariano doing it too, and I went to off-center the ball and let my... The okay, so straight forcing fastball with a little turn at the end. Yeah, yeah, but I, I had to do it at the end. I had to kind of Turn it over. With a little end. wrist action? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's see this. Let's see this nasty cutter in action. <laughs> nice. That's that late downward movement. And you know, it's a good cutter, but I think there's actually somebody in the league that had a better cutter than you. And there he is, number 42. Me. I love better. This guy is a natural. This is the guy that, that you can never try to do it like him because nobody will. And I, the reason I believe Mariano is different is because his, his cutter came naturally. Sure. Perfect mechanics, got it even better. And then Mariano himself, his durability actually made him special. Well, you had four great pitches. He only had one, but you both had great careers. And again, I think it's because you had those incredible fingers. We got to show that one more time. Here I am. <laughs> this is the full grip for me. There he is all the way around twice. And that's all you need to do, kids back home. If you want to be a Cy Young, uh, three-time Cy Young winners have four amazing pitches. One that could get you in the Hall of Fame, but that's not enough. Go ahead and get four. No problem. Take it away, Keith. Thanks, Dirk. Thanks, Pedro. Dirk, define a player's manager for us. Okay, well, a player's manager is one of those tired cliches in baseball that seems to get thrown on a guy who has a bunch of wild characters with great charisma and quote-unquote leadership skills, the kind of stuff you only see really pop up when a team is winning, because when a team is losing, this guy's not a player's manager, he's a bum, right? Mm -hmm. But there are player's managers out there, and essentially what that means is that this guy understands that his players really do run the team. He's not saying, I want you to do it my way. I want you to act how I'm telling you. I have a system in place. I know that these guys are veterans. They have something they want to see. They have uh, a character they want to install in the team. And they, he gets out of the way and says, go do it. You guys are older. You're making the decisions out there on field. You're the guy who's going to make or break my career. I want you to play to your strengths. I'm not going to get in the way and force you to do anything. You manage yourself. And Players manage. And and he's an athlete in the middle of a $305 million contract. 
and yet he supposedly put something in his body and had no idea whether it was good or bad. And this is a man who used to have a Yankee employee flashing him signals from the stands about what the last pitch was because he couldn't be sure what the last pitch was while he was in the on-deck circle. So do you buy any of the idea that he could really insist he didn't know what he was putting in his body? I think the question here is, can you believe anything that comes out of this man's mouth ever? And the answer is a decided no, you cannot. Look, this is a guy who he has a, a mansion with a picture of himself as a centaur hanging in it. He makes half a, a billion dollars. He has an armada of lawyers at his disposal. You're telling me there's not someone, not one person that said, maybe you should think about what you put in your body if you don't know what it is. I'm pretty sure we have meetings for that every season in baseball that says if you don't know what it is, get it tested. There's no excuse for stupidity, even as stupidity as profound as that of Alex Rodriguez. Uh, by the way, the centaur story is unconfirmed. I saw you just said. You've seen, I think you've seen an I, artist rendition. Well, the Dirk and Spock story is confirmed. We live in a Photoshop world. That's all I'm just saying. Mm, well, this is a very interesting theory you bring to bear, but no, sir. I don't like it. I don't buy it. You know what I think happened? I think we just had a fundamental breakdown of pitching. We had a young guy who got intimidated by one big swing of the bat, and that swing involves Delman Young. Okay, so Danny Salazar, you got a 100-mile-an-hour fastball. You just faced a guy who is a dead red fastball hitter and has been crushing the fastball in the postseason for the last two years. He got you. You made a mistake. He made you pay for it. That doesn't mean you abandon that 100 mile an hour fastball. And the Rays can have all the conversations they want to in the dugout about triple digit Ched. They've still got to make the adjustment to it if you're locating it. The answer is not to do what UC Salazar are doing here. Go to the off speed pitch and be afraid of your biggest weapon. That is your heater. You just need to command it a little bit better, but instead what he does is, is he starts showing them the entire arsenal. And you know, you can't put the whole blame on Danny Zalazar. You have to put some on Yan Gomes here because he decides to keep calling off-speed pitches instead of going out there and saying, hey, look, I know your favorite toy just got hit over the fence, but it's a good toy. Let's locate down, stick with the plan, then do that, and that's the difference. But there was somebody in tonight's game who did stick with the plan. And that guy is Alex Cobb. Wow, what a game he oh, threw. It was beautiful. It was awesome. Is uh, you're, you're professionals and you should be able to do it in the middle of the night if they schedule the game at 4 a.m. with uh, early streaks of sunshine coming in. Well, I, look, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that I love it when there's shadows as a guy who needs every advantage he can possibly get to get outs. But at the same time, I want to say that you are getting paid millions upon millions of dollars to hit a little white ball with a stick. You can get over the shadows, right? I am? No. <laughs> this is news to me. I'm wearing a bad uniform for it. <laughs> Dirk, he is uh, considered having done his job if instead of three for four in the wild card game with two homers and two RBI, he was 0 for four with no homers and no RBI because of this. Well, look at this. This is, I mean, this is goaltending right here. How many possible bases advanced for opposing runners did he stop right here? Look. I, from playing with so many catchers, they, they like to say that pitchers are head cases. Now, I don't know if that's an audit of me personally or an audit of pitchers in general, but I will say it's true. I mean, we get a little nervous out there. We turn into a bit of a head case, and when you have a strong, capable, inspirational leader sitting just 60 feet, six inches away from you saying, hey, I know what's best about you. I know what you can do well. When you get rattled out there, look at me, and I'll get you back in order. That's a great asset to have, and you can rely on Russell Martin. Hey, if I throw that ball in the dirt, he's going to block it up and make it look like you meant to throw it there. You didn't get the swing. You'll get it next time. Go ahead. Feel comfortable doing it again. That, to me, that's huge. If he goes 0 for 4, but he does that every night, I will take it because I'll feel good. He'll make me feel like the quarterback and the prom king. Dirk Hayhurst told me to ask him last. Uh, I was having trouble deciding, but I got to go with my heart on this. And you're going you're gonna to giggle because I giggle every time I watch him throw. It's Bartolo Colon. I love to see him throw. I mean, he's 40, throwing 98% fastballs, and he, he's just... You know, he's this big juxtaposition guy out there. He's so cuddly and the big cheeks. And he just makes you feel like anybody could pitch. You know, I like it. I want to see him do his job. Well, all right, I'll giggle. <laughs> Actually, I shouldn't giggle about the A's. We'll start with Dirk and Price. And really, he was the ace in Monday in Texas. Absolutely. I, I love Joe Madden. I don't necessarily agree with the moniker that David Price has a Peter Pan-like attitude <laughs> because when he gets out there between those lines, he is a killer. You see those crazy Pedro Martinez eyes when you're hunting Gary Sheffield. 
He loves the big games. He embraces them. Joe Madden did say this, and I agree with this 100%. There are four steps to the evolution of a big leaguer. Step one, you're just happy to be there. Step two, you start to realize you can do it. Step three, you know you're good. You want to get paid for your services. And finally, step four, you want to beat the best. All you care about is winning. David Price got to the big league. He skipped directly to stage four. He loves this kind of situation. It's a chance for him to show everybody that he is the best by beating the best. This is a tailor-made situation for him, and the numbers bear that out. And he's already in, uh, in the best, among the best, the best at Fenway Park for pitchers of his, of his left-handed variety. What? But you're Sonny Gray now in this equation, all right? What do you you take know it. that you I'll know take that? Because <laughs> yeah, right. you can't. The surgery is over in your career. Right. <laughs> you 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 know he knows that. What do you do about the fact that you haven't that they haven't seen you before? Well, I don't think I change a lot. I think I just do what I have done to get myself where I am. But, but what if they're what if they're waiting you out? If they're waiting me out, yeah. okay. Hey, I cannot pitch to uh, your weakness. I have to pitch to my strength. I have to know who I am. That's the best weapon I have out there. I have scouting reports on you, but if that requires me to reinvent myself mm -hmm. or change my approach, you have technically already won the battle. You have changed me as a pitcher on the mound. I need to keep to my strengths and trust that they're good enough to beat you, even if. I have to go against your strength because statistically the pitcher should beat the hitter at least 70% of the time. So mm -hmm. I'm going to fight that out. Well, Speaking of dressing, we could not go any further in the program without asking this vital question of Dirk Hayhurst. Does it light up or does it spin or does it just, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. If I, the spinning model was way too expensive. If I would have got another year in the big leagues. That's, you would have been able to afford yeah. the whole, uh, but because there's a power pack on this side. So, so <laughs> before anybody asked or before you, Mr. Internet, we, we, we made our own uh, <laughs> gift. There it is. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, boy. All right. So, it's yeah. just a platform to embarrass me. Yes, that's exactly. <laughs> so to, I'm sure if you, if you go to uh, our website, you can download that. Night because you worked with him again. There they are. The That's publicity right. photo. Yo, daddy. 2011. <laughs> Yo, daddy. Uh, Stephen Moe was my daddy. You love pitching to him. Other guys on that team love pitching to him. Did That's we right. see why last night? I think you did. If you watched Sonny Gray as he went through that game, there was not a lot of shaking going on. Stephen Vogt knew who Sonny Gray was. He knew what signs to stick down for him. He didn't confuse the issue, and that's crucial. That's a huge game. The last thing you <laughs> want to have out there is double-mindedness, not being on the same page. you got to have a feel for your pitcher, what he's thinking, what he likes to do when the pressure is on, how he's going to respond to that, and that means you got to do your homework. you got to be hanging out with this guy. you got to see what makes him tick. I think Stephen Vogt mm -hmm. did all those things, and then the baseball guys rewarded him for his effort with a chance to play hero there the night. Out there with Liriano I think, doing so well. And I think you like Kelly because he likes to break in a spontaneous dance and you like to wear lifesaver <laughs> shirts. <laughs> but I got to say that I think the odds-on favorite here is going to be Francisco Liriano. I, I, would, disrespect I wouldn't to disagree. Kelly, but I like Liriano in this matchup. He's got 161 innings pitched, 163 Ks. He's going to get a lot of outs himself this time around. And I don't think Kelly can do the same thing. And Liriano's only given up nine home runs so far. So he's keeping the ball in the park, which is crucial in the postseason versus St. Louis. You saw the numbers early. I'm going to give you some more. 127 batting average, 167 slugging, 343 OPS, and that .75. Five ERA that is beautiful. Here we're going to take a look at the slider strikeouts. He owns the bottom portion of the zone and he goes to the back foot against right handers and he sweeps it away from left handers. He's been so consistent with that pitch. He is really going to give St. Louis trouble tonight like he has all season long. Yep. And you don't like McCutcheon 3? Well, it's because I don't think the traditional saber metrics in baseball actually do overlap on that. Now look. I know very well after talking with you all off the set that you are just circling around me like sharks no, right no. now waiting to chew me up. But I'm going to run with this. I'm going to run with this. I am going to run with this. Okay, because the number three hitter comes up less often with, with less chances and less runner in scoring position. I feel like the number two hitter should be your best hitter. I mean, this is just, I'm making a purely mathematical statistical argument based on looking at numbers and production and opportunities. And that best hitter on this Pirates lineup is Andrew McCutcheon. So, I mean, from a statistical standpoint, if we're talking about a guy who can change the game with one swing of the bat, get on base when you need him, advance the runners and drive guys in, he fits that bill and I want to give him as many opportunities as I can and that's the number two spot. That is my argument. Feel free to destroy. Well, I'll, be, I'll jump in on that one because, <laughs> you know, number one is like you, you, you're saying it like he has three Hall of Famers in his lineup, exactly. which you don't. This is the guy. 
if your, th your third place hitter has to be the best player on the field, and he's that guy. If you're talking about, you know, he got a Hall of Famer hitting behind him, uh, he has a Hall of Famer leading off, he has a Hall of Famer hitting fifth, then you can say that, but now you want to take him out of the third spot well, you, when he can no, do all wait, things. Wait, wait. Did you battle out? Oh, oh, okay. Did you battle out at, th at, at me, third me? base? Did you did you did you uh, <laughs> battle out third in the lineup? Absolutely. Okay. So okay. I know what you're Just what to you go ahead, do. Tom. Just okay, a little caveat. Yeah. Yeah. Just the absolutely. difference weird. between the two hole and the three hole over 162 games is only about 18 or 19 plate appearances. This is a best out of five. It's right. not a best exactly. out of 162, so it's inconsequential. And plus, you don't want him batting two spots beyond the pitcher in a National League lineup. There are no run scoring opportunities if you're going to move him up closer to the pitcher. Your turn. If I had Big Papi behind this guy, I mean, I'll, I'll be pleased. Or I'll, I'll have a Manny but, Ramirez or someone like that. But where is Big jump. Papi? Uh, uh, no, he's I in mean, Boston. Be, uh, yeah, he's in Boston. <laughs> but the thing is, it reminded me a lot of what we saw last night. Jimmy Williams, I mean, uh, um, um, Jimmy Leland, saying that he brought Porcello in to try to get a ground ball, hit right at one of the infielders, and get a double play Good on the bases job. loaded. That sounds perfect. <laughs> Isn't that what we wish? But, but at the same time, how can you have your, 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 your best player, the one that can run, can, can, can bring in some runs, uh, hit for average, get on base? Yes, it will be lovely. But who do you have? After him. Okay, okay, okay. Ooh. I'm willing to concede that you hit third a lot, so you, of course you're going right. to favor the third guy. You're just a big nerd, as we know from listening <laughs> to the internet with movie star hair, and you're a guy that's wearing a shirt made out of kids' breakfast cereals. Yeah. Okay, Keith, what do you think? Who's Keith? batting third? Who's batting third if it's not McCutcheon? We're going to clone him. We're going to stick him in the third Well, spot. that's a good answer. answer. That's that's answer. 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 There it is. Yeah, great answer. Sure. Well, a, then. Ma a ma mathematic one. Clone him seven times, and then you have you have eight of them in the pitcher batting. And he clone him a ninth time, he can probably pitch too. Yeah, nine McCutcheons will, will make uh, it. Quote: Dirk Hayhurst couldn't hack it. Tom Verducci wasn't even a water boy in high school, but yet they can still bash a player. Save it, nerds. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Look, you, you're you're all right now. I, I'm good. I think it was just he was obviously more upset with himself than he was upset with anybody else. Oh, I don't know. I get that? I, I don't get know. That. He called you. He didn't call me a nerd. I feel and you left got out. a baseball blog named Baseball, baseball nerd. nerd, and you didn't <laughs> get it. You didn't get it. Tom, can I have some water? It's <laughs> Dodgers and Braves first pitch at 807. Pirates at Cardinals first myself. pitch at 437. <laughs> Our last pitch till the postgame show. It. All right, what was what was it really about? Because it seemed to, as they kept talking about the intimidated, intimidated this, he's trying to intimidate me. It it got to be a little silly sounding when oh, you heard goodness. the post game this interviews. This is such ridiculous baseball player macho machismo. I will not be intimidated. You're not going to rattle me. I'm some rookie. Wait, no. You, you, you weren't intimidated, but you were thrown off your game. <laughs> Look, Grant Both Balfour, he goes yeah. out there and he has conversations with Grant Balfour while he's pitching. So, I mean, look, he's, he's an interesting personality, to say the least. And I think this was a meeting of the eyes that lasted a little bit too long that ended up being a posturing contest. Now we're walking towards one another. Who's the bigger man here? Answer, neither of you. You both look like fools. You almost cost your respective teams a serious a situation that could be damaging for the series. When I look at Pedro Alvarez, I see a guy who can pretty much pull whatever he wants whenever he wants to. So you're going to think soft away on him, hopefully to use that pull tendency and get him to roll over. But of course, you can't just fill that down and away area with soft pitches. He will make the adjustment. He is a veteran hitter. You have to protect it by going in, going up and in hard, showing it to him early, making him think he knows that he sees it, and then working him off of it, pushing him off the plate, and then going back to it. Hopefully, you don't have to K the guy. You don't have to go hunt for the strikeout. You can use his aggression against him, and if you use that soft away, I think you got a chance to just at least mitigate the power and hopefully get that rollover. It's not happened, which meant Stephen Vogt has played every game, acquitted himself well, a, a home, a, a game-winning hit, then a triple. I mean, that's that's that that I mean, during the regular season, that was probably a month's worth of work for him. It was, and look, he's a former teammate of mine. I love to abuse the broadcasting <laughs> privilege of talking positively <laughs> about former teammates. It would have been hard if he'd not performed, but the fact of the matter is, 
he has performed. He's been very good this season. It's a great story in and of itself, but what he does so well is he's a great contact hitter. I mean, when I had him in AAA, it was amazing to see the balls that he could get to. He had a great 10 pitch at bat against Justin Verlander, who was all kinds of nasty when mm -hmm. he took them out in game two. I think that Steven Vogt is a guy that's still blossoming in the big leagues. And right there it is, one single one forearm gun. gun. Right. It's, it's one, all because of the single forearm gun. One gun vote. I think he has a, a <laughs> lot of upside, and I'm not just saying that because I get to say it on air. I think he has a lot of talent. I think he's getting a chance to showcase it, and I think if he continues to have a big productive postseason, it's going to make him into a star. One man, one vote, one gun. But Dirk, this next part is yours as we continue to, to on the job train for learning how to use the teleprompter. It was Mark I'm DeRosa so last week. Now, this is your spotlight dance. <laughs> To find out what your team needs to do to take the next step forward towards victory, go to bleacherreport.com slash JW next step. JW, of course, for Johnny Walker. And while you're there, check out some of my behind the mic previews starring the lovely and talented Pedro Martinez. Stay classy, San Diego. How's that? <laughs> to Clayton Kershaw, who, because of the way they worked things out, is going to go now in game two. Well, you saw an amazingly well-pitched game with Adam Wainwright tonight, and you're going to see some very good pitched games going forward to Clayton Kershaw, one of the best, and he does something, and there's going to be a pop quiz on this when we're done here. Mm -hmm. See if you can figure out what all four of these pitches you're about to see have in common. Not only are they nasty, not only are they thrown by Clayton Kershaw, but there's something else. He executes very well, but he also throws from the exact same slot on every pitch. Fastball, curveball, slider, change, everything comes from the same arm slot. It doesn't go up or down. He doesn't vary his timing to do it. He mixes it in well, uh, and that line. makes yeah, it yeah, very yeah, difficult yeah. to pick up what you're about, to, what you are going to face. Now, that is what I was always taught to do as a pitcher. I wasn't always able to execute it. I strive for it, but that's just my opinion. I think it's great, but. Adam, you've faced guys, you've faced Kershaw, you know what it's like to see a guy who hides the ball well from the same arm slot. How tough is that for you to handle? Well, the main guy that you think of when it comes to arm slot and different pitches is Max Scherzer. And uh, as, as we retool the desk for the National League Championship Series, we end the evening by saying goodbye to the two people sitting closest to me, which should be a lesson for Mr. Verducci and Mr. Martinez as we go forward to Adam <laughs> oh, Jones. No. We'll get to Adam in a moment, but first to my friend Dirk Hayhurst. And we want to thank you both for your great work, but particularly Dirk, who's been here since, since the beginning of time. And so, <laughs> now, waka waka for you. I understand. Run! I understand. Run, boy, now, run. Watch, watch what happens here oh. because you can't really catch a nerd. So, Dirk, you're not as, much, job, Dirk. not as much leaving. I got beamed up. Right, as escaping. So, <laughs> That's right. So, congratulations on that. Well, we did want to do one one final thing here before we say goodnight. We're going to show these things now or just, uh, all right, here, all right. These are, from, again, from my friend Steve Moore, the veteran baseball photographer from New York. Dirk, you look like, there's no nerdness in this picture at all. It's, it's the rare moment I actually look like an athlete. 2008 yeah. spring training, Dunedin, Florida. You nailed it. That's it. Toronto Blue Jays. Dirk, Moore, uh, Dirk Hayhurst, courtesy Steve Moore. And again, this fabulous picture, except for like the car and the brick wall, of Adam Jones <laughs> as a shortstop <laughs> in the Seattle Mariner farm system. Again, by our friend Steve Moore. Great pictures. It's been a pleasure to work with you, Adam. Thank you. I Thank appreciate you, all you guys. Good to see you. Dirk, my friend, Thank safe you. travels. And, uh, and now we, we, the nerd count has been lowered here, so I'll, Hasta be, la vista. I'll be I'll be the, I'll be <laughs> the nerd at this end of it. Hasta luego, mi right. hermano. Good night from Atlanta and LCS game one tomorrow night uh, at eight o'clock pregame, eight thirty-seven first pitch. We'll see you then. Yeah. Hey guys. Eight more seconds. So anyway, let me just <laughs> yeah. timing has not been working too well. Hey hurt. Okay, there you go. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. Burgundy. 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 But he didn't have it. His wasn't velvet. Wow. No. Oh, oh, no. Oh, Clark Kent. Yeah. <laughs> that picture. What is that picture altered at all? No. No. I didn't think so. <laughs> I wore that to prom. Yeah. Last week.